thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I, I have, uh, I, I have a, a warm spot in my heart for IPAM, and uh, which you can see. I mean, that's the second time in less than three months that I'm here. I flew all the way across. To, uh, okay, so um, I for the last eight or nine years I have been uh, working. One of the fields on which I've worked been working is using image analysis to develop uh, to, uh, tools that are useful for art historians and art conservators. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, some of those uh, today. Uh, and on Wednesday, there's another lecture, I forget what time, where I'll, I'll talk about some more. Uh, so it really all started with uh, Rick Johnson, an electrical engineering professor at Cornell, who uh, about 10 years ago was on sabbatical in France. He visited the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam and met the conservators there. And he was very impressed with how much science they used. They used chemical analysis, x-rays, infrared, and so on. And he asked them, why no image analysis? And they were kind of surprised because they said, why should we? We are highly trained visual experts, and they are. It's amazing the things they have observed and know about these paintings. I mean, for instance, Van Gogh used to uh, uh, not, not wait till his paintings were dry and stack them against each other. And so they see on some paintings impressions of other canvases. And then when he realized that maybe he shouldn't do that, he would put some newspaper. And they see imprints of that newsprint and so on. So they are indeed incredible visual experts. But uh, Rick Johnson said, well, image analysis can actually do lots of things that we are not so good at doing with our eyes. And he convinced him, he brokered, he became a broker, even though he himself was not an image analyst. He worked in audio signal, uh, signal processing at that time. Uh, but he brokered between teams who were interested in image analysis and the Van Gogh museums. Uh, he brokered a, a, a workshop image processing for art investigation, IP for AI, and uh, where he made available to those uh, image processing groups the, uh, uh, oops, sorry, uh, data, high resolution data of these paintings in the collections. And uh, things are changing, but it used to be that it was very, very hard to get access to high resolution digital uh, data sets corresponding to artwork. Um, so in order to get access to those, I had to kind of sign my soul away in case they ever leaked. And they haven't, so I'm still uh, the happy possessor of my soul. But um, we've had uh, about five workshops since every 18 months to two years. And we typically like to hold them at a museum or an art institution because we like uh, it there to be art historians and art conservators in the audience who would not go. I mean, I don't know how many of them will be here at IPAM right now. But anybody from the art conservation? And you see, it, it, that's why we go to museums. Uh, uh, because we want to have a mix of art people and data people. OK, in the very first workshops, uh, because they didn't really, we didn't really know how to, to frame it and so on, we were given focus tasks by the museums. And after that, after we started knowing people in the community and other problems came to us, we uh, kind of, of, of went away from these, these, these task-oriented uh, workshops. But the very first one, uh, the Van Gogh Museum asked us whether we could distinguish work from different periods in the artist's life, or whether we could put our finger on similarities in style between Van Gogh's work and that of artists that he admired. Uh, and so. We worked on that, and I have here a little movie in which I show uh, uh, what we came up with. I mean, so, and I'll come back to how we got this. But so here, this is a kind of mobile where we show paintings. Different, these are all paintings uh, by Van Gogh, except for the ones with the red dot. Some of these are paintings that he admired when he was younger. Others are paintings that were in his collection when he, uh, when he died, but that are not by him, like this one. And then there are some that are uh, forgeries, like the one that's coming on the top right there, that's coming to the front now with that <coughs> red dot. That's a forgery of the 1930s from the Wacker collection. Um, so let's do that again. Uh, and what, what you see is that the dot pictures are much further away 
I mean, so if you imagine that this is a mobile in which distances in space correspond to a distance that we computed, and I'll tell you how, then you see that from the center, the center of gravity of this representation of that distance matrix, you see that the red ones are much more to the back, except that uh, uh, the, 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 the Waka one, yes, it's further from the center than others, but it's not as far as some of the other ones that are really in a different style. So we were doing okay in characterizing style, not so much characterizing copies from forgeries. But uh, that has not been the goal of the uh, Van Gogh Museum in the first place. Um, but, okay, so how do we do this? So let me uh, tell you that. Um, so we analyze, we really do a lot of image analysis on these paintings. So we had them at high resolution. And we try to look, uh, so for each painting, we would use, we look at patches of the painting. And so every patch was a data set for, for us from every patch. Uh, we had many patches in these hundred and so many paintings. And we would uh, look at image content at different scales and try to identify at what information, at what scale information lives and find hierarchical relationships among scales. And we would summarize that for each patch in a kind of statistical, in the feature vector, uh, uh, which we would then use to compute the distances. So let me explain about how I determine information at different scales. Uh, so I'm going to do it all. Ah, I, I do it all because this is a public lecture without formulas. But I had a colleague at Bell Labs who said, a picture is worth a thousand words, but only if you have the thousand words. So I'm going to show you only pictures, but I want to assure you I have those thousands of words. I mean, and I can give them to you afterwards. So, okay, here is one of these, these uh, uh, paintings by Van Gogh. And let's look at just, uh, uh, imagine that we blur the painting. Then, I mean, first of all, how can I start computing with these paintings? Well, these paintings, these are high resolution digitizations. So every pixel, if it's a black and white version like here, is just a number that corresponds to the gray level with zero standing for all black, 255 for all white. And then that gives us 256 total values in all. That's eight bits. So between that zero and that, uh, that all black and that all white, the 254 levels of gray. We have many more shades of gray than people in literature do. <laughs> uh, 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 give us numbers for each pixel. And we can then, pixel by, we can then compare different versions of the image by looking at differences. For so if I blur this image a little bit, and I look at the difference between them, I see this, and I, let me enhance it, and then you see that. You see that what I'm, 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 what I'm seeing is exactly the information that lives at very fine scale, and it's slightly blurred away. I mean, all those fine lines. And uh, you can do that in many different, so let's, 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 in order to see that we do this at many scales, let's concentrate on a little bit here, which is this edge of, of, the, of the left clog. Uh, I blur, and again, and again, and I can look at the difference each time. Now I'm showing you color, but that's just in order to bring out the, the sign. I mean, you see I have red and green. One of them is positive and the other is negative, because differences can go in both directions. Uh, here, and another difference. So if I look at these three consecutive difference images, then you see that they have features in common. For instance, the edge of the clog is can you can see that everywhere. That's because a sharp edge, if you blur it a bit and you blur it and so on, is always, always going to see it as an edge, more and more blurred. But, but so that lives at all these scales. But there are other features. I mean, like here, if I take these little areas and I blow them up, then you see that I can see something at a very fine scale. It's more uh, visible at an intermediate scale and it's disappearing again at a coarser scale. So there are things that live at other scales. I mean, edges live at all scales. There are things, features, that live at intermediate scales, and that will go away again. So uh, that is what we, so we look at the statistics of in what angle do we see things, in what angle do things live at different scales, what is the probability if I have something at a fine scale that I have something at a coarser scale at that same pixel, and so on. We make that a little statistic out of all that with uh, about 140 features, features, and for each patch, we have down that feature vector. And then we can look at all the patches within the same painting, and that gives us an idea of how similar or different patches are within a painting. 
And then we can compare that collection with another collection. And we can look at similarities. And that leads us to define a similarity or dissimilarity or distance between paintings. Now, when you have that pairwise distance between all these paintings, of course, it's not something that you really can embed in three dimensions. But uh, you can find the best possible way to embed it in three dimensions. And then you can try, because I mean, I can talk about this, but I mean, I had to explain this to art conservators. So uh, what we did is we made a virtual mobile and we made it rotate. And that actually was a good way of conveying that information. OK, so what happened is that uh, prior to the workshop, a few months prior to the workshop, the television program Nova had heard that we were uh, going to have this workshop. And they thought this might make some nice television. And in fact, they made a snippet, I mean, about 15 minutes of television out of this. I mean, uh, there's a lot of preparation that goes into 15 minutes of television, I found out. Uh, and you can still find it somewhere on, on the web. Actually, if you Google Nova Van Gogh uh, authentication, you will, you will come out and you will see, you see Neil deGrasse Tyson explain. And, and, then, and then lots of... of uh, OK, so uh, what did they do? They asked us whether we would be game to get uh, six copies of paintings that we wouldn't have examined in high resolution. And uh, well, still in, in gray level. You see, uh, Van Gogh, of course, is known for his sense of color. And, uh, but uh, although we had signed all these documents and so on, the Van Gogh Museum still didn't quite know, even though Rick Johnson, who they trusted, vouched for us. They still didn't quite trust us. And so uh, they, in order to make sure that we were not going to make a lot of money out of printing wonderful art books with the high resolution data they gave us, they gave them to us in black and white. They figured not many people will be interested in books <laughs> on Van Gogh in black and white. And they were right. But so that's why we have only grade level data here at this level. And so we knew that. Five of these were high resolution scans of a true Van Gogh painting, and one of them wasn't. And they said, we'll give you these data a week ahead of time, and uh, we'll then, uh, at, uh, at the time of the workshop, we'll organize a little session separately where we'll, you'll see which one it is, and you'll have to compare with what you found. You'll have to be on camera first stating what you found, and, then, and, uh, and we were game. And, uh, and indeed, if you look on, on internet, you find that not only we, but also the two other image analysis teams found that it was this particular painting that was, had been a copy. Uh, now, to, to get that copy, uh, they had commissioned uh, uh, somebody who is an expert on making copies. We'll see her later in the talk, so I won't tell you too much about her now. But so it was, some, it was a copy painted by somebody who paid particular attention to how, how, how you get these, uh, the brush strokes. Uh, not exactly the same, but the same kind of style, the same kind of brush, work, uh, brush stroke work in, in, in the painting. And uh, so uh, I had a student, and we had a, we had a kind of in-joke. Every time we, we were really happy about the result, we would give each other a high five. And so we high fived each other, and they liked that. So we had to do that spontaneously five times. <laughs> and uh, 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 so I'm, I'm on the net, internet high-fiving my student about us uh, having this, this correctly. Um, now, what, what is it that we really see? What we believe we see, this is a completely different painting, nothing to do with Van Gogh. But if I look at this painting and I take a very, very tiny little piece, I believe it's, 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 it's somewhere here, and I blow that up enormously, then you get here, you see, you have, you, you see the individual uh, uh, hairs of the brush. I mean, that's how fine the resolution was we had. And what we believe, this is actually a copy, is that uh, the, when, when, when uh, the artist, when the copying artist makes a copy, uh, she, she tries to keep her hand as steady as possible to, in order to get that brush stroke in the right way. And as a result, she moves more slowly than if she paints freehand. And so we believe that the result is that you have a little bit more wobble, which then you see in the very, very high frequencies. And in fact, uh, for characterizing style, our earlier analysis with 140 features was fine. We found that in order to uh, distinguish copies that had really been meant to have the right uh, brushwork, the right style, from originals, we had to restrict ourselves to only the very high frequencies. 
In the coarser frequencies, you wouldn't see a difference. But in the high frequencies, we saw that, and that's what we believe we see. Um, but it's like often in, in, in machine learning, uh, we, we, we have good accuracy, but it's not as interpretable as you want because it's a very mix of many features and so on, and we'd like to work too much more interpretability. I'll come back to that. But so that's what we saw. Now, uh, the Van Gogh Museum said, well, all that is very, very nice. Uh, uh, you have, uh, that was a nice television, but let's try to be a little bit more scholarly about this. Actually, uh, we, we are interested also in, in copies versus originals, uh, or forgeries versus originals. And they, for the next workshop, they gave us a, uh, a new data set for the first time we got some color. Uh, and they, uh, uh, one of the paintings, they said, uh, is a copy of a painting. And it's actually a copy that we have in our collection. The reason they, they treasured this copy in their collection is that it, it gives them an impression of uh, the uh, color use of Van Gogh that they don't have anymore in the original. It's the portrait of two little girls uh, in a garden, and their dresses in that copy have some, have some pink, have some pink features, while the painting by Van Gogh is pure white. And that's because Van Gogh, poor as he was, used a vermilion that was very bright, but not stable over a century. And uh, so when he used lots of it, of course, it's still there, but when he had a little pink, uh, detail in a girl's dress, it has faded away. And the, the copy was made by somebody who could afford much uh, uh, better paints, and he used a much more costly vermilion. And so, but that's why they treasure this painting, because it gives them an impression of more stable colors than in the Van Gogh painting itself. But that's why they have the copy, and they said, we have this copy, so you should be able to. And we said, sure, of course, we can do this. We, we are on television. Uh, uh, <laughs> So we looked at the fine scale detail of these 21 new added paintings, and we were really, really taken aback. Because our classifier, this classifier that was so accurate, but not very interpretable, considers that all of the newly added paintings have features that are more like copies or fakes. And we knew that wasn't true. I mean, some of those paintings had a, a long history as being completely authentic, and there was no question about it. So we did it our analysis again, we tried again, and so on. And, and uh, finally, we asked some of the other teams, we said, we, we have a problem. And they said, oh, you too? <laughs> and uh, so what we found out when we asked is that, in fact, they had, I mean, we really should have paid more attention earlier to data acquisition. So what happens is that these scans, of course, they did not hook off the Van Gogh and put it on a scanner and then scanned it. I mean, you don't do that with Van Goghs. Uh, what, what, but what happens is that museums have high resolution slides, I mean, big slides, positive slides, that are used whenever somebody uh, gets permission to use uh, the, the copy in a book or and so on. They pay a fee to the museum. The museum will let them borrow this slide from which they have a high resolution uh, uh, version of the painting. And so what uh, uh, Eric Postma, the computer scientist with whom they had worked, had done is he had digitized these slides. In the meantime, he had bought a different scanner. And the new slides we'd gotten for the 21 new paintings were on that new scanner. And so they were much sharper. And that's what we were detecting. So, uh, but that made us realize also that uh, we really should have taken into account that whole data acquisition chain I mean, in fact, when we looked back at all the paintings we had, um, we could uh, try to find how blurry each painting was, how blurry each photograph was. And you can do that because if, if uh, all your, your, your digital uh, uh, snap and shoot cameras do that, I mean, uh, if, if, you, if things are blurry because of, of not particular focusing or because slight motion, that has an effect on edges has an effect on T-junctions, it has an effect on corners. And you can infer, you can try to infer, what the blur was from looking at these effects on T-junctions, edges, and corners, and calculate back. And that's how your pictures look a bit sharper than they might be otherwise. But uh, we didn't want to sharpen up, but we could, based on that, which is uh, in the literature, we could infer 
how sharp or not sharp the picture were. And so we defined a blur index for a whole data set where zero went f was no blur at all, and one was the blurriest thing in our data set. We actually found that the photographer in the Amsterdam Museum was typically a little blurrier than the photographer in the Kruller Muller Museum. So we could distinguish those photographers. But in any case, when we did that on the Van Gogh, on, on the Nova data set, this is what we found. The picture that we had all singled out as the, the standing out from all the others did stand out because since it was had been painted two months beforehand and the picture had been taken directly with a digital camera, I mean, the picture was just sharper. I mean, so to this day, we don't know whether what we detected is that the picture was sharper or really the brush stroke difference. I mean, so fortunately, I mean, here I was, I mean, I'm, and I still am on the internet high-fiving my student for something that may be a complete fraud. Uh, uh, fortunately, we had completely independent of this also wanted to have a, 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 a validation test for what we did. So what I did is I asked Charlotte Kaspers, who was the painter that the NOVA program had uh, uh, used, had asked to paint this copy of the Van Gogh, and who is a, who was then still a, a, a graduate student. Um, she, she, she's now an independent artist, but uh, working for many museums. Um, and we, we asked Charlotte Kaspers to make a data set for us which uh, is now available to anybody who wants to, to use it, in which she actually... Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about Charlotte Kaspers and why she has... Uh, how she uses this expertise in copying she, she, she has. Here you see her at work on a detail of uh, one of the panels of the altarpiece in Ghent. If any of you have seen Monuments Man, this is the painting that they were hunting all over Europe. I mean, it's an incredibly important painting in uh, uh, Western painting uh, uh, art history, and it's a fantastic painting as well. So uh, it's, in, it's undergoing a restoration campaign. As part of that, of course, the panels were taken down, and they used the opportunity to ask Charlotte to paint a panel and uh, in three versions, uh, which were copies every time of the original, but stopping at intermediate levels so that people would get an a view of what these paintings looked like before they were finished. And you can now, if you go to the Cathedral in Ghent, you can see these uh, panels that she painted. Here's another one that she painted for a museum in Rotterdam, uh, where it's, n uh, it's again uh, a medieval uh, uh, altarpiece. It's again a fragment of a medieval altarpiece. And so she did the preparation, all the, the, the first, she stopped uh, a quarter of an inch, a half an inch short every time. So, no, quarter of an inch. Quarter of an inch short every time. Here you see the naked wood. Here you see the first one layer of glue and so on. It's only here that she starts putting gesso down. And then you have all these layers of gesso. And then it's only here that she starts putting the drawing down and so on. And so <laughs> it's only here that she starts painting. I mean, so uh, she, she makes these pieces which are extremely high quality and, and wonderful so that people can look at it, they're educational pieces. She also, for a museum in, in Maastricht, has made a copy of a Bosch painting that children can hold. I mean, of course, I still have to be careful with it, but I mean, you're not going to go make them hold a, a Jeroen Bosch painting itself. So, uh, so she is incredibly trained for this, and she made uh, a series of uh, small paintings. So in, in, in 2000, uh, um, in 2010, she spent a few months at, at, my, at my house, uh, a few weeks at my house. Uh, since she was still a student, I didn't have much money for this project. I could get her to come by paying her ticket and room and board and pocket money, and she could spend half her time visiting all the museums in New York that she wanted. And half her time, she uh, made some of these, these small uh, 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 studies of uh, tchotchkes in my house. And here you see her making a copy, and you see how she's holding, she holds this, this wooden board to hold her hand steady as she's making a copy of this painting. So uh, we made this little studio in the basement. I mean, you see my son's drum set there. And uh, so uh, the, the reason we did this was that we had a data set which, where everything was painted under the same light conditions by the same artist and so on. This was going to be a proof of concept. If 
we could do it in that data set, there was something to be found. If we couldn't, then maybe we were just seeing different hands by different people and so on, rather than the act of copying. Okay, so we had a whole lot of these. Uh, I still have that whole collection. They were with a variety of materials and styles. Here is something very open and on a heavy canvas. There is something on, on a board and, and uh, with a much flatter uh, way of painting. She, so we, we, we know everything about the data set. It's also, we scanned those paintings directly, so we had a much shorter chain of, of data acquisition. And what we found is that uh, we could distinguish copies from originals in these paintings when she used both hard and soft brushes. When she used only soft brushes on a very smooth background, we were not so sure. Uh, and what we found that the difference made was the very fine details, in, in, but also some other features. And we still wanted to understand. We actually made the data set available, and it was then analyzed by a group in France that uses completely different image analysis techniques. Uh, they use a kind of fractal analysis and so on. But they also found, came to the same conclusion about which pairs they could distinguish, could find the ground truth, and which they couldn't. Um, now, how we, we, we did that, so if we, if we take two paintings, green is original, red is the copy, then we would make them into patches. We would use, we didn't want to, uh, uh, to, to, to have the same content, because ideally you'd like to use 50 paintings by the artist and then look at a painting that is controversial. But, I mean, we didn't have that. I hadn't money to pay Charlotte to paint. A whole gallery full. So, uh, and for each style, we only had one pair. So, be, but it was so high resolution that we would cut it into patches, and we would use different patches. So, none of the patches are the same in here. We would use uh, patches from the original and the copy, which were not the same content, and then we would use yet other patches in order to do the testing. And um, we found that, as we said, we could uh, distinguish copies from originals. We wanted to revisit that sometime because it was, although we had good accuracy, it was, I mean, not very interpretable. I mean, and, and if you wanted to tell this to, to experts, you want to express it in painterly terms. In, I mean, and we didn't have that at all. Um, and in 2013, I had a, a postdoc who really was interested in doing, in revisiting this. And so we revisited the original study. And uh, we made some changes because uh, Charlotte, after the, we had done the first thing and I discussed it with her, she had been delighted we could distinguish because she didn't think we would be able to. But uh, when she later found out that we had used our patches, as I showed you, all over the painting, she said, oh, you really shouldn't have used background patches. You really should have concentrated on just the objects in the painting because the background I made freehand in both paintings. It's not not part of, of uh, so you should so we should have masked out in both the training and the test set the background and concentrate on them and uh, my, my postdoc also said that she felt awkward about all these these dispatching all over and especially now that we were I mean if we were going to make little rectangular patches then we were going to lose even more so she just distinguished it into layers so she grouped things. I mean, again, we took different content for testing and training, but uh, she took uh, sets. And um, what she found is that if we did the same techniques as before, uh, the results were quite a bit less convincing. And we were wondering why that is. And uh, I mean, it turned out that uh, in the meantime, machine learning had made progress. So if uh, uh, it turned out that although they were less convincing, they were still significant. But as we tried to think, why was that? Why now that we don't take patches that are close to each other, but in, in, in strips like that, why are we having problems? And then I realized maybe we had again been, uh, I mean, the painting at which, for which I showed it to you was a painting with very heavy canvas. I mean, actually, some of the paintings had heavy canvas and others didn't. And those that had heavy canvas, we had 
more of a problem once we started looking at, at no longer neighboring patches in test and training. And so maybe we had been learning the Canva. Yes, we had, could see these are from one and these are from the other. If we were learning the canvas, then that's hardly uh, uh, convincing. Um, so, however, in the meantime, we had for a completely different uh, uh, study. So the results, especially with better machine learning, were still significant. We also have developed a way of removing canvas artifacts from a painting, uh, which we have used. And in fact, the results still, uh, with the newer methods, show us the difference between original and, copy, uh, and, and, and uh, copies if you remove the canvas. Canvas removal, actually, is uh, one of these examples where uh, other problems came out of the woodwork as we talked about what we could do. Uh, let me segue a little bit aside, because I, I thought it was a fantastic uh, uh, example. There was, uh, so after one a talk I gave in Brussels, uh, somebody came up to me and said, from the museum in Brussels, he says, we have a Gauguin. Uh, it's in very bad condition. It needs to be restored because, uh, well, uh, Gauguin did not uh, is painted on, on, on jute, so it's not very well primed. It's and so on. So it, it, it really, but the, uh, the 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 guy who's going to do the restoring. I mean, before we start restoring, we always study these paintings very very carefully and to, to see what is going on. And he's having problems with it because the canvas structure is so pronounced. I said, well, but it must have been pronounced when he painted it. So he said, no, no, no. He said, because these things get varnished. And in the valleys, you always have a little bit thicker varnish than on the mountains. And that varnish was not a very good uh, varnish, always yellows. But this varnish has darkened a lot. So the pronounce is now much more pronounced than when he painted it. And in order to, I mean, he's going to remove it, but in order to plan what he's going to do and, and so on, he likes to think ahead. He likes to be able, and it's impossible to think those away. And uh, I mean, I find it strange that you want to be able to think these things away before you actually do the physical thing. But I mean, we, so we, we studied how to remove that canvas structure. And when we showed that, he, they were very happy with that result. I mean, it's a result I would never have tried to do, because who thinks about trying to remove canvas from a painting? But uh, he did. We could do that, and so on. But that means that we had this technique, so we could apply it to these paintings and check whether we could do originals and copies. And we could, and I was very relieved. But we had also, in the meantime, uh, thought of making a new data set in 2013 as well. Uh, Charles de Caspers came to, uh, 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 to spend two months in North Carolina. She spent one month on, the, on what I'm going to show you, and then uh, uh, another month at the North Carolina Museum of Art on a project that I will talk about on Wednesday. And she made paintings on masonite, so which is a very nice, very flat wood board that is used to, for, for, for artists. So there's no canvas structure. We knew we wanted to steer away from that. And also a truly blind data set. What I mean by that is, so she painted this series of studies of birds. And for the blue jay at the very top there, uh, we know which is the original and which is the copy. Green is the original, blue is the copy. Uh, we also have a smaller set of hummingbirds that she painted where we know. But all the others, she made a marking on the back that made it clear so she could make records and so on. But it doesn't say original or copy. And that information was put under sealed uh, uh, cover in the art department. I mean, so the uh, Department of Art and Art History at Duke has uh, uh, that information. Uh, uh, and we don't have it. And we have never had it. I don't know what these other paintings. Uh, and so um, the, the idea was that as we develop techniques, uh, uh, we other, other tools, we are going to, to uh, make predictions for pairs and then publicly unveil our information and test. So we had a, a, a very good undergraduate who did an honors thesis on, in statistics and who worked with the two originals, the, the blue jay and the hummingbird and looked at these two cardinals. And so she, uh, she studied the cardinals. She again used the feature vectors that we had. And she tried to see which one were the better ones. I mean, she actually did a very detailed and very beautiful senior thesis. 
and uh, she then uh, uh, had a, a prediction. It turns out that she was not as, as, as confident as she would have liked because the blue jays actually are only about this big and the cardinals are quite a bit bigger. And of course, the brush stroking changes depending on whether you have a smaller or larger painting. But nevertheless, she felt about 80% confident in her decision of which of the two was the original and the copy. And uh, let me show you. So uh, what happened is we organized a little party. We organized a little party at Duke, I mean, and uh, where we put up the paintings and people voted. I mean, we explained to them and people voted and so on, and they all got ice cream as well. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, he uh, here's is uh, Robert Calderbank, who is the director of the inter of the uh, the in information initiative at Duke, and who's asking uh, uh, one of the the funders uh, to open the envelope. The envelope had been coming over from the art department. We didn't know, and so he opens it. I'm explaining to the, the whole audience what I've been explaining to you. Bridget is standing there. And so you see we had 26 votes for this one and uh, a fewer votes for the other one. I forget how. I mean, actually, I, I liked, I mean, if I had been a female cardinal, I would have preferred him too. He looked much more <laughs> spicy. I mean, so 26 versus 16. And, but Bridget had voted for uh, the, the 116. And these are the, or the originals on which she had, uh, uh, for which she, the, the, the training data set. And so here, and so she's selling, yes, I have that one. And so Robert now has the information. And maybe I can. Uh, So Duke undergraduates, he's saying, are the smartest people in the world. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm hearing it, but you do not. And she got it right. So, uh, so I, I posted this to, uh, to uh, uh, so I posted this to Charlotte, and she was very pleased as well, of course. So um, I have. I'm glad that I have a little bit time of time left to tell you a little bit more. So that is about originals and copies. Uh, we now, what now Bridget is going to do is she knows this, these, these, these red cardinals, and she's going to next work on the pair of these two runs. Uh, so now she's going to have a set, a data set of the same size as uh, the, the, the test data set. But again, we don't know. And uh, we already told the art department they should prepare another envelope. And uh, Bridget's going to go to, to do this during the summer before she starts her graduate uh, studies. And, uh, but as I said, uh, do I have a little bit more time? Yeah, OK. Uh, what's really interesting with this whole program is that whenever we do something, uh, and I talk about it, and there are art historians and, or, or art conservators in the audience, uh, they come up to me and they say, if you can do this, maybe you can help us with that. And this is another a project that came up like that. This is a project um, that was brought to us by uh, Joris Dick and Kun Janssen, uh, who are two material scientists, except that Joris Dick is also an art historian. And they had done a study of this uh, little painting by Van Gogh, which is called uh, an Polotje uh, Gras, a little patch of grass which he had painted in his Paris period. And it was known that if you turn this painting sideways uh, uh, and you look at it with an x-ray, you see that there's something else underneath. And this is, uh, you see that it's x-rays because you see all these nails on the, on the stretcher. Uh, and which is not a surprise. I mean, about uh, Van Gogh was, was poor and canvas isn't cheap. So uh, whenever he felt that a study had uh, taught him all it was going to teach him, he would, if he didn't want to keep the painting, he would put a layer of primer over it and paint something else. About 30% of his paintings have something else underneath. So that's not so surprising. The reason why people were especially interested in this painting is that uh, uh, in the voluminous correspondence between Vincent and Theo van Gogh, which has been preserved, 
there's a letter written from Vincent in, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands to his brother uh, then in Paris, where he says, I'm, uh, I have been experimenting a lot recently with a very dark palette, and I'm trying to capture and render the idea of color with only this restricted palette. And uh, I'm painting, and we do have hundreds of portraits of peasants in these very poor light conditions in which he was painting them. He says, and I'm sending you here a painting in which I think I succeeded uh, 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 really very well in this. And although we have that letter, we don't have that painting. There was no such painting corresponding to his description among uh, uh, Theo's effects when he died. But we do have this painting, which was painted in Paris, underneath of which is clearly a portrait of a peasant in the style in which he painted when he was painting these portraits in Nunen. So there are good grounds to believe that this is that painting. Of course, with a Van Gogh, you don't start scraping off the top layer. Um, <laughs> but people were interested in, in, in seeing what was underneath. And uh, uh, Kun Janssen and Joris Dick um, uh, actually uh, uh, proposed a method which is now used much more uh, and, and is now being made into apparatuses that people take to museums in order to do these measurements on paintings. But then that was not the case. They used X-ray luminescence in order to uh, uh, look at these. What that means is that they looked at, with a very high energy X-ray beam, they would look at a little pixel, pixel by pixel of the painting, so one pixel worth. And they, this, is the, the, this would excite the uh, photons and the electrons. They would, uh, uh, the electrons in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the atoms, they would ionize, and then the electron would drop back, but in two jumps. And the bottom jump is between two bound layers of the atom, and so has a particular energy that's characteristic for the element that you're looking at. And so by doing this high energy X-ray bombardment and then measuring what the frequencies and the intensities you get out, you can see what elements are present at different places. And so this is, for instance, what they did pixel by pixel in, uh, in, in um, antimony, which was a component of the Naples yellow, the only light color Van Gogh had on his palette then. This is in uh, Arsene, which is a component of the vermilion that he was using. And you see how the lips stand out. Of the... And then uh, this is in Mercury, uh, in which you actually almost don't see anything of the picture below. You mostly see the picture on top. Um, you also have uh, big black uh, spots where you don't see anything at all. That's because there was a lot of impasto on the top painting and the x-rays hadn't penetrated and we have no data there. And, uh, and then there is this funny region um, here. If you look, if you follow my finger, then there on top you see these kind of zigzag patterns in the image. And that was a, a, a data acquisition problem. So uh, I think I can show them to you here again. So this is what I showed you. Uh, what happened is, this, why, where do you get a high energy x-ray beam? They didn't have one at the time. They didn't have an apparatus. You find those in hospitals, in hospitals where they use them in order to make short-lived radioactive materials that they use for medical tests. And typically, when, when they have, because these are expensive things, when they have one like that, they have set it up in such a way that when it's not doing its day job, the beam can be sent in another direction to an experimental area where physicists use it for experiments. And that helps pay for this, this, this expensive thing. And so they had obtained uh, some time in this experimental area to examine the painting. And when the beam was in their direction, the thing was on a sled they would measure a spectrum, and then the sled would move a little bit. They would measure and so on, because the beam was always in the same place. And then, of course, when as soon as the beam was needed again, it would go back to its day job. And then the whole thing had to stop until it came back. And apparently, there was a synchrony problem. And so the scanning going in zigzag like that caused this kind of, of uh, now, here you see it very much. But in fact, there are little breaks all over. There are typically five or six breaks to six breaks in every line. And uh, so what they had done in order to, to, to read the, the, the picture out was to, to, uh, uh, to correct a little bit by hand 
but they asked, can you do mathematically something better than this? And yes, we could, because what you do is you, do, you write a variational algorithm where you go through it in several sweeps in order to, ah, Stan, you're going to like that, to minimize the total variation. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so we could correct. And then once we had corrected, what we could do is we could mask all the black blobs and uh, we could inpaint and really literally inpaint because it is painted brush strokes that you can reconstruct. So we would do that. We inpaint it. And then uh, for these long stretches that came from the grass, we masked those as well and we inpainted, we marked those and then we inpainted those as well. And then we still had problems with the eye. You see there's, there's stuff here around the eye that we'd like to correct. And we didn't really know how to do that. And so we asked art conservators, and they say, oh, you use the other eye. We do that all the time. So we said, well, <laughs> we can do that. And so we got the other eye. And so we had already a much cleaner version of this lady. But then there's also the idea of color. And so, uh, oh, here you see, actually, how the inpainting works. It really works very nicely and, and delicately. I mean, uh, inpainting algorithms uh, use the idea that you, you, you know the surroundings. You can study how the artist painted elsewhere. So you know if you start at the beginning and the end what was likely in the middle. And so you inpaint it gradually. And then, so this is actually, this is something that uh, uh, Eight, eight years ago, if you typed in Van Gogh and woman portrait uh, and you hit images, all your hits would be this because it made such a splash to get a better impression of this lady underneath. The, we called her Lady Six Millimeters Under, which is something the art historians did not like at all. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 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 so uh, she, uh, they had colorized her. You, fact that they had yellow and red, but we're missing, actually we don't have enough spectrum because we're missing the, 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 the things for the rare earth, for the earth colors, not the rare earth, the earth colors, all the ochres and so on, and the burnt sienna. And, and. So uh, what we did, however, was we looked, so you see the yellow and the, or, and, and the red is what gave this. What we did is we looked at other portraits that Van Gogh had painted in this period. Uh, so this is another one, the one with the least contrast that he painted. And here's one with the most contrast he painted. And what we found is that if we, uh, uh, if we, de if we separated the color information into luminosity and then the color uh, distribution, then, uh, so we took the contrast away and the color distribution, the color distribution, and this is something that you cannot easily see uh, with, with, uh, with our eye, was actually much more uniform from one painting to the other than you might have thought. And so what that meant is that we could use the information that we had in order to infer with reasonable confidence what we didn't have. And uh, that led us to this. And so we had gone from, ah, I forgot. But so we had gone from this version to this version of the lady six millimeters under, and she really came alive a bit more. 